And then I can use, then I can just use internet.
Okay. Good. Hey, camera guys. Here in the back of the test, room. test. Is it coming over the room speakers? Is it coming over the room speakers, not just the camera? <laughs> okay, so hopefully your mic is working with the room. I know it's working. Oh, there we go. It's working. Okay, we're good. All right, we're going to. All right, class, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, did everyone scan in with Cora in the back? Yes. Make sure you scan your card. That's how we take roll. So if you are here and you haven't scanned your card, go do it right now. I posted this on Canvas, but just as a reminder, the way we're doing roll is if you're here by 1235 and you scan your card, you're on time. If you're after 1235 but before 1245, you're tardy. Anyone showing up after 1245, you're considered absent for that day because you've already missed like 15 minutes of the presentation, but you can still sit here and you can still take the quiz. You just need to, you won't get credit for being in the class, okay? Um, another couple things I put up on Canvas, uh, the Bootstrap Your Business competition for this month is up, the application. So I encourage you to apply if you've got an idea and you wanna get it going and you wanna win some money for it, you could win up to $500. We had a couple winners in the class last month, so, this is, it's for you, it's doable. And uh, the deadline on that is October 22nd. So October 22nd at midnight is the deadline. October 24th at 5.30 p.m. in the GSC is the event. Again, I posted this all on Canvas. So if you've got questions about it, you can message me there. Um, so I wanna introduce our guest speaker today. We're really glad that um, Rusty and Becky Bastian are here with us. So Rusty grew up on a farm in Aurora, Utah, working with his dad, grandpa, and his brothers. He attended Snow College, so he is a Badger, as is his wife, Becky. They both played sports here at Snow. Rusty played uh, baseball, and Becky was playing volleyball. After they both served church missions, they got married and attended Utah State University, where he graduated in exercise physiology and later received a master's degree in Iowa in physical therapy. So I'm sure Rusty's going to talk more about his story and how he ended up at, at Redmond. But uh, after practicing physical therapy for a few years, he started working for Redmond Minerals, which is not related to physical therapy, but it's all part of the journey. Uh, and he received an MBA from University of Utah. He's been president of Redmond Minerals for the past 14 years and spends much of his time in strategy, culture, and business development work. For those of you that don't know, Redmond is, is located just about... 30, 45 minutes south of us in Redmond, Utah. So, and they, he's gonna talk more about salt and other products that they make. Rusty, Becky, and their family live outside of Richfield with a mean rooster and too many dogs. So please welcome Rusty Bastion. Thank you, can you hear this? Is this on? Okay, perfect. Uh, so this is our, our crew now. My son on the right, Brock, he was at Snow, uh, I guess not last year, the year before, and wishes he would have stayed for one more. He, he went to uh, BYU to play football, 
had a great time up there, but uh, had a lot of really great friends here. So we love Snow College, and so I'm glad that we could be here uh, and maybe share just a few ideas that, uh, honestly, uh, some ideas that no one shared with me. I'd love to spend, to save you some time and maybe effort uh, to give you some ideas to think about. So I just wanted to show these two family pictures to contrast the ones that my parents took when I was growing up. So if that guy on the left can become the president of a business, you all are in the running. And what the heck was my mom thinking? Allowing me to go out of the house like this. So this is um, probably the worst picture of our, our family we ever, that I've ever seen. But uh, anyway, that's us. So that's where it started. And entrepreneurship started way early for me. Uh, I had a friend, and we loved fishing. And so we thought, you know what? We need to find a way to buy 22 shells, Jake Spinalures, and Pepsi. And that's pretty much all we needed. And so we decided we would sell worms in a self-service worm station. And we, we made some good money. We made way more than we needed for those things. And so um, it was a good little business for us. And so that's, that's when entrepreneurship started for me. Uh, and I grew up on a farm in Aurora, just down the road a bit. And um, my family owned a farm directly across the street. 100 acres of our farm was across the street from this place called Redmond. And um, I promised myself I would never work at a place like that. I'm never going to work a place like that. And so I was the first person in my family to go to college. My dad and grandpa actually tried to talk me out of going to college. They uh, said, hey, you know what? We've, we've been farmers forever. You know, honestly, in my family, for generations, we were farmers, ranchers, or cabinet makers. That's what we did. And, uh, and my, my dad said, why don't you just stay and do this with me? And, and I don't remember the day when I decided that that wasn't for me. I, I truly loved growing up on a farm and working, having the, the privilege of waking up and with my grandpa. Actually, this is how it went. He'd knock on my window at 6 o'clock in the morning and he'd say, it's 6 o'clock and damn near noon, get out of bed. And so... That's, that was the start of my day, most, most days, as Grandpa doing that. And, um, and so we'd get up and, and we'd go to work, and I loved it. But I knew that I wasn't going to be a farmer. And, and I knew I wasn't going to work at a place like this. And so I decided um, that I'd go to college. And I went to Snow College, played baseball, um, Hung out of my girlfriend's uh, house a little too much. You can see the little thing on the wall there. You know, I, I don't know what the rules are now, but I don't think I was supposed to be in as often as I was. And the picture on this side, I still haven't forgiven her for because right after we took this picture, she dumped me out on the road out of my own truck, and uh, I wasn't able to play baseball the next day because my knee was messed up. So. So, but it, as you learn, I mean, it, it worked out. So, <laughs> so um, we went on missions, as, as you heard earlier, and we got home from our missions, and we decided that for two years, we weren't going to get married. We both wanted to just go and date and see the world a bit, get some education, and that was on a Monday, and on Wednesday we were engaged, <laughs> and, and um, so we uh, were married five months after I got off my mission, and, 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 and Becky as well. And, and so, growing up on this farm, no one ever asked me, what, what do you love? What do you really love? And so what I did is I opened up this book, 
and this book said physical therapy, the job of the future. And it says you, you can make good money, you, know, you can have your own hours, you can help people. All those things were important to me. And so I said, okay, I'll be a physical therapist. And so I go and get a master's degree in this thing that I really knew nothing about. And no one had ever asked that question, that super important question, what do you really love? And about a year and a half into the process of getting this master's degree, I knew this wasn't me. I wasn't a guy that could be in one office all the time and, and rehabbing a total hip every day or a total knee or redoing a shoulder because once you've done it, once you've figured it out, it's kind of the next one's kind of the same. And there's some, sim there's some differences, but there, there's a lot of similarities to it. And I, I need a change. I need difference. I've always been an athlete, and I, I love this, I guess, just the challenge that comes with that. And I, I needed something that was going to be diverse and challenging and different every day. And being in an office, in the same office, every day, I could tell wasn't going to do that for me. But I was deep into this. I was $70,000 worth of student loans, years of time taking my wife and then a baby halfway across America to do this. And so I was kind of all in at that point. And so I got out and um, practiced for a couple years in physical therapy in Richfield. And, um, and after that, um, came home one day and had a friend that decided to buy this business called Redmond Minerals. And he'd been trying to get me to come work with him. And I said, no, I just really don't want to do that. I got all this time and money in this education, and I just don't know that I can do that. And finally he said, hey, I'm going to buy this, and I'd like to have you come help me run it. And we talked about it, and it would have been crazy not to do it. And so I did. And so I went home and told my dad, who didn't want me to go to college to begin with, that I was going to go be a salt miner after all these years of education. And uh, I won't tell you the words that he said <laughs> at the time. <laughs> no, I won't say it. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he just, uh, he, he didn't think it was a good idea. And um, honestly, you know, it was a great idea. And so I end up at the very business that I told myself I'd never work at. And, and, I, and I believe this, it's that your greatest opportunities, they're going to come to you in times that, that you're not expecting. And they're going to come to you in ways that, that probably are obscure and in ways that you just haven't thought about. And so you've probably got this plan for your life. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you've got some sort of plan. And I think in our lives, having a plan is super. As long as we're open to the fact that that thing we planned, there may be other, even better things out there for us. And right now, what you guys are doing is preparing. You're preparing for whatever that opportunity is. And I love this quote by Churchill that says, to each there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing. Unique to them and fitted to their talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds them unprepared or unqualified for that which could have been their finest hour. And, and the thing is, you don't know when that is. You don't know what that Tuesday afternoon obscure conversation with a friend that you weren't expecting is. And so you can't be so narrow as to prepare narrowly. You know, life, that's what I love about the idea of general education, becoming an educated person, being curious about life, so that when that opportunity comes, that you've prepared for it. You're, you're, you're ready. 
for that moment. That, and you can take advantage of it at that time. And, and by the way, I'm super informal. If anybody, while we're talking here, has a question, even during the presentation, feel free to ask whatever. Uh, we'll maybe have some time at the end to talk. But if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to ask anything that, that you want. Um, that question I asked earlier about, you know, what do I really love? That's one of these circles here. This is from a book, one of my favorite books called Good to Great by Jim Collins. In this book, he talks about this, this red part in the middle. He calls that your hedgehog principle. The thing that, so a, a fox is really smart, and he's good at a lot of things. He's quick, he's cunning, he can get around. But a hedgehog, he only does one thing, but he does it really well. He rolls up into a ball, has spikes on the outside, and when he rolls up into a ball, a fox can't get to him. And so he's got this one thing, but it's like a superpower. And he can outfox the fox every time by doing that one thing super well. And so part of life is figuring out where that place is for each of us. What is that place? And that place, these three circles, where they coalesce or come together, that's what it is for us. What we love, what we're truly passionate about, what we can be really great at, and not just good, but great, really great. And what drives our economic engine, or what can we make money at? So if you've got the two things over on this side, if uh, you're passionate about it and you're good at it, but you don't have something on this side, that's called something. It's called a hobby. And a lot of people have hobbies that they try to make into businesses, but they haven't thought about, hey, does the market care about this? And if we don't consider what the market thinks, then we aren't going to be able to have a legit business. We just have a hobby. And we, probably, we all probably know people who took these two circles and tried to make a business out of it. And how did it go for them? It, it didn't go well, I can say, because if it would have, there would have been an economic engine and they would have made money at it and maybe they're still doing it. But, but so as, as we're looking at opportunities in life, we have to consider all three of these things. And so a business has this, um, and I think, hopefully, you guys are all going to have families at some point, and hopefully a family culture has this, too. And hopefully, independently, within ourselves, we have this individually. And so figuring out, before you spend $70,000 to go to a graduate school, Figure this out for you. Take some time. It's the perfect time. I mean, most of you guys are probably in the first two years of your education, I think, snow being a, uh, uh, a two-year school. So now's the perfect time. Spend some quiet time thinking about this really important question that nobody asked me. And, and I think if, if they would have asked me, I don't know if I would have at the time really thought it through because I, had, I didn't realize how important it was, but it's, it's super important. And then um, I wanted to ask this question too. Not only what's your he hedgehog concept, but you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to maximize? I had lunch last week with a guy that just graduated from Stanford uh, with an MBA, and we were talking some strategy about one of our businesses. And um, my son is at BYU playing football. He, he's up there finishing uh, uh, business school right now. And he's got a year left, and he wants to go work for a while, and then he wants to go get an MBA. And he's wanted to go a place like Stanford or somewhere like that, a really good school. And so I just ask him the question, 
I said, is it worth it? Is it worth it to go to a tier one school knowing how much it costs uh, and you know, the competitive nature of getting in, all these things? And um, he, he asked this, he, he paused. and He's a young guy, and I gotta tell you, I was super impressed with the fact that it wasn't some reflexive response. That, oh yeah, I went to Stanford and it was super great and your son should do it too. It wasn't that. He, he paused and he asked me this question. He said, so what, what is he trying to maximize? And it's a, it's a very insightful question because, you know, we all in our lives, we have limited time and resources. And if... And he said, you know, if you want to go to a huge corporation and just get in quick on the ground floor and make a ton of money, he said, Stanford helps with that. He said, but if you're trying to maximize other things, let's say he wants to go to a, a business that may not be like some super huge business and have a really great job and provide well for, for his family and still have time to have work and life and everything else, he said, maybe he doesn't need that. And so, and I don't, I'm not trying to say don't go to Stanford, because he still may want to, and that's great. But I think that knowing what we want to maximize is really, really important. Because if we spend too much of our time trying to maximize the wrong thing, there's this thing in business called the theory of constraints. And, and it's really important to understand because when you're investing in business, you don't want to invest more into something that is not your constraint, not your bottleneck, not the thing holding you back. You want to make sure that you're investing in that thing that's limiting your ability to, to move forward. So in life, you have to, this is another one of those big questions. So I'm going to ask two or three really big questions today. One of them is, what do you love? And another one is, what are you trying to maximize? What, so you're, you're not just like here at Snow College to spend time and money for no reason, right? You're trying to maximize something. You're here for a purpose. Um, I was here to play baseball, and to chase girls. And I was pretty good at those two things. Um, I really didn't get into education until later. I don't know where you guys are, but um, yeah. And um, that, was, that was my goal at Snow College. That was what I was trying to maximize. And I had a different plan after my mission and after some people taught me some different things. But, but you have to ask yourself in, in the big picture, what is it? What are, you, what are you trying to maximize? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as we've talked about, I, I ended up at this place called Redmond. And, and you may ask, what does Redmond have to do with entrepreneurship? And Redmond is a, it's a salt mine, is what it is. And it started in 1958, some brothers... We're in a drought down there, and they had a farm with some salt on it. And they decided that they, uh, instead of trying to grow crops, they were going to try to sell this salt. And so they did, and they sold it as the low-price commodity salt because it had this, this dirt in it, <coughs> these minerals. And... Um, and so that, that's how it got started. And so they'd sell it for road salt here in Utah or to the local farmers. And, um, but after time, they realized, hey, this is unique. It's got some pretty cool minerals in it that other salts don't have. And they found out that there's really only five places in the entire world that has a deposit like this. And so they started to see some value in this. And so when... When my friend Rhett talked to me about this business, it was some of this has already taken place, and what we talked about was not even, not even the product. What we talked about is the fact, he said, hey, how about you come and help me 
run this, and I said, well, I've always seen business as a place where people take advantage of one another, and I got into physical therapy so I could help people, and that's what I wanted to do. And he says, well, what if we could create a business where we leave the community better, we try to leave the associates or employees better off, and we try to make their families better off, and the, and the community that we're in better because we're there. I said, well, if we can do that, then I'm in. I'd like to do that. And so that's kind of been, for the last 21 now years, kind of our experiment, is to see if with these minerals that we can, we can do that. And you can see in this middle circle here, this <coughs> the, these words, elevating the human experience. And so in the end, we, we, are, we sell salt and we sell minerals, we sell clay, we do a bunch of other things I'll talk about in just a minute. But really, those are means to an end. Um, those, we do those things so that we can elevate the human experience. We, we spend a lot of money every year on the development of our people. We spend probably almost a million dollars a year uh, on classes, uh, experiences, uh, retreats, different things uh, to develop our people. Because we feel like if we've got people who are passionate and well-trained and know that we have their best interest in mind, then they're going to be very, I guess, on point to do their best to make sure that our customers are happy. And if our customers are happy, then we make money. And so money is actually a side effect of, of what we're doing. I think it's super easy to try to short circuit that and to try to just say, hey, here's a product and I'm going to go sell it and have it be this transactional way of doing business. But if, if, if you want a long-term business that you're going to develop and that people are going to want to invest their lives in and to stay at for a long time, it has to be more than that. I don't think that these, these businesses that are trying to just guess, ring benefit out of their employees. There's a lot of churn. It costs a lot to hire new people. It's, it just isn't a good idea. It's a bad business model. Sometimes, so we take, here's an example. We take people down to Lake Powell. We have houseboats down there, and we'll take our associates for a week. Uh, and anyone, just from the guys who are mining the salt to selling the salt or whatever, anybody in the business, we take them down about 60 at a time and go down and spend a week at Lake Powell. And we spend probably $500,000 a year on Lake Powell. I spend a month of my year, it seems, down there. Way too much. My wife wants me to spend more in the summer, and I kind of gripe about it. But, uh, but that's, that's, that's what we do. We spend a lot of time with that. And people say, well, it's a benefit. And it's a perk. But we don't look at, like, look at it like that at all. We seriously see it as a very serious investment. We see it as, so when we go down there, we have a class in the morning, we hike or do water sports in the day, and then we have another class at night. But we feel like if, if people will do that and engage and get to know the people that they're working around on a, on a deeper level, that when they go back, they're they're more engaged. They're better at what they do. And so it's, it's way, it's, it's not a perk. Nothing that we do, it's actually kind of an offensive word almost, we, we feel at Redmond, the word perk. Because we feel like perks are what people get without giving anything in return. And we don't believe in that. We believe that the world needs to be win-win that we give something and we get something in return. And we feel like, we, and I'll talk about this in a minute too, charity is great and we, we give a lot, but we feel like the biggest charity that we do is by creating businesses and jobs and all these things that leave the world better off. There was this article in the Wall Street Journal um, that talked about Bill Gates and how wonderful he was because he gave money to 
uh, the Gates Foundation, like a billion dollars. Um, and so that is amazing. Uh, but they said, you know, that is a pittance compared to what Microsoft has done for the world. What all of the, the jobs that he's created, the value, the technology that is all over the world because of what he's done. And, and that's what we see. We, we feel like the value that we create is in our work. And that the way that we do our work is important too. It's important to our employees, it's important to our associates. And as you can see here, we've done more now than, than just salt. We, we've got some table salt that I'll hand out here in a, in a while. We own a, a, a fencing company, the largest fence company in Utah. Some, some, uh, we own a few health food stores. We're starting a couple farm to table cafes up north. We own a fishing lodge in Alaska. Um, a few different things. Um, and the way that we look at it is kind of like the Warren Buffett model. Independently operated businesses with a, with a parent company where the benefits are um, over an umbrella, but all the businesses are independent, independently operated so they can be <coughs> nimble and quick. And that's kind of the way, way we do business. <coughs> so when you talk about what you want to maximize. So I, I wanted to talk about entrepreneurship. So the, the, way, the reason this is entrepreneurship is because within Redmond, my goal when I came to Redmond, I was going to be here for two years. I was going to be here. I was going to get my MBA. I was going to figure out how to do business. And I was going to go do my own thing. That's what I was going to do. And then I get working in this business. And I figure out that, hey, I'm working with my friends. And if I want to go start a new business, I've got this pile of money behind me in this business that I can take and go start something new within the business. So I thought, oh, I can go out on my own and try to round up a new group of friends and try to figure out a new pile of money. Or we can do it right here. And so that's kind of what I, I've been doing for a long time now is there's a business called uh, Trophy Rock. It's the number one selling mineral product for deer hunting in America, and um, we started that, and I kind of helped start that. And then we had a different business called Redmond Equine that is a, an equine business, and I helped start that. And, and we had some different opportunities in the DIC market where we needed to recategorize the way we sell and have different classifications and expand that market. <clears throat> and so, when someone has an opportunity, they can come to us and say, hey, here's an idea. And then we vet the idea, and we say, is this one of our best ideas? Is this something that we want to invest money and time and talent and effort in? And if it is, then we do it. And so we have a lot of freedom within the business to be entrepreneurial, to, to start new things. We, we don't think that just because somebody has a title behind their name, let's say they're the president or the CEO or they're the whatever else, they don't always have the best ideas. Sometimes the best ideas comes from the guy that's taken the rock off the belt. And if we listen to that guy, he's going to come up with an idea that we could turn into a product or turn into a mineral or a customer. Last year, we had a customer from Montana come and say, hey, what if you put garlic in your salt? I thought, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> and like for cows, not, not for garlic salt, but for cows. And he says, it kind of keeps the flies off. And so we did. We put some garlic in a bag with some salt. Our entire warehouse smelt like Italian food. <laughs> but we sold like $350,000 worth of it last year. And so, and that's the first year. And it's not even in distribution yet. And so that's an idea from a customer from last year. And so you don't know what random Tuesday afternoon is going to bring you your next new product either. And who the guy is or the girl or whoever who's going to bring it to you. You just have to be open to, to those ideas. <clears throat> and this is one thing that in my life I'm trying to maximize. I asked my wife this, this question. What, what are we trying to maximize? And, and I 
and I thought about it myself. What am I? What am I trying to maximize? And for me, um, the thing that I am trying to maximize is creation. I, I love creating opportunities. I love creating new jobs. I love creating ideas, um, new products, new product categories. And the thing is, though, it's not all business driven. Also, trying to maximize this sort of thing. And this is the evil rooster, by the way, <laughs> right there. <laughs> my, my son Seth has mosaics down syndrome. And if you, anyone goes out in the yard and tries to touch this rooster, he attacks me. And um, he not only attacks, like he'll come after you and I'll like kick him up in the air. I'll kick him like football, kick him this far off the ground. And he will like go like this and he'll come back at me again. He's like persistent, but um, he was a grand champion evil rooster at the fair this last year. And this is uh, my son Seth that has mosaic down syndrome. He will put his head on Seth's shoulder and I'll come home from work and I'll hear cock-a-doodle-doo in my house. <laughs> Seth will have him on the, the couch. And so that's, but, but these are the things that, that I'm also trying to maximize are these things. And so I want to make sure that we're not only trying to maximize the creation of businesses or money or those sorts of things, although those things are super important because they allow this to happen. And in the end, this, this is what we're going to care about. This is, this is the stuff that we're going to wish we did more. And, and my son, Max, in the back, we adopted him from Haiti. Uh, when he was two, he's 12 now. As you can see, um, we shot him in the head with an arrow. Um, and we were down in Mexico. And so we, we have a lot of moments like this. But uh, anyway, these are things I want to maximize. Okay, perfect. And, and as we go through life, so we, we have a choice. You know, we, we can either live like this or we can live like this. We can live with kind of a closed mentality or we can live like this. And, you know, luckily I've, I've had a chance with Redmond to travel. I just, while I was preparing for this, I, I looked it up, traveled to 26 countries doing this sort of thing and helping people. And this, this bottom left, this is the first trip that I went on, went to a to uh, Kenya, and we were, there's a company up in Orem that had a micro credit organization that we were looking to see if we wanted to get involved with, and uh, we went, and I was going to help these people. That was what I was going to do, and I thought, you know what, we're going to go and we're going to help these poor Kenyan people, and I came back, you know, just very humbled, because they helped me way more than I helped them. They help me see the world so differently. They help me see that, you know, it's not our job to fix people or to make people different or to make them all like America because they have some super great things to teach us and a lot of things that we can learn from them. And Maria here, you know, she is, I don't, this was a couple of years ago in Ecuador and we would work this, this red building behind there. Uh, we built them a community center uh, for the older people. They had nowhere to gather. And she had no, no roof where she lived. She was living in a, in a place that didn't have a roof. And so we would take the old roofing material off the building that was dilapidated and old. And, and she would strap 50 pounds of this on her back, and she would walk home. You can see how small this little lady is. This is me with her over here. She's a small little lady. And she was happy all the time, all the time. She would come and she would make everybody that, that, she, that she saw just happy, always. And, um, and so I guess that is my last big idea is if we can live like this instead of like this, life is better. And every person 
that you meet has something to teach you, every person, without question. Regardless of where they live, what their ideals are, let's say they're a flaming liberal and you're a Republican, they have something to teach you. And you have something to teach them. And part of our problems in America today come from the fact that we've, we've forgotten that. We've, we think that it has to be divisive. It has to be us versus them. And that's, that's not what it's about. Um, really quickly, if we, I was hiring someone today, this is who I want to hire. I want to hire somebody that's hungry, humble, and smart. And people smart as well as smart in their area of expertise. But first off, people smart. Because we can teach them part B there. But we can't teach A. A, you've got to have. And you've got to be able to see people around you. So if, if you can have these things, it's not about knowing every little bit of what you've learned in your trigonometry class or psychology or whatever else. It's this. If I would, when, when we find a person like this, you know, there was a guy that I found like this. We didn't have a position for him. There was nothing available. But I said, when you want a new position, you call me and we're going to hire you. And we didn't have anything open at the time. But we said, hey, go figure out a way to create value. Do some good things because we know you will because you're this. So if, if you can be this, there, you can write your own ticket because every business out there wants this person right there. And um, finally, I just want you to know that, you know, I grew up on this little farm and um, I spent a long time trying to tell myself that, that, that I belonged and that, that I was worthy of, of being able to, to be successful. And come to Snow College, and I thought, you know, there's no way I can compete with those people at Snow College. And then Utah State and Iowa and... University of Utah with people from Xerox and the Huntsman Center and all these different places. And you know what? You can. You can. And, um, and learn that sooner than I did. That, that you, you're worthy of it. And you can, and um, one of my heroes, Clayton Christensen, he said something. He, he, he asked the question, you know, in the end, and if there's one book to read, it's called How Will You Measure Your Life by, by Clayton Christensen. And he asked this question, he said, you know, in the, in the end, if you can measure your life the way that, <clears throat> that God's going to measure your life and try to maximize those things, that that's, that's what's important. So, so that's my final thought is, Try to maximize those really, really important things. And that's that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Any any questions before we end up? Here. So we in this room have, have different things to maximize. Part of which we're, we're attending snow goals to maximize. Do you have like some strategies that work for everybody to maximize in general? Apart from our attendance. So it it depends. It's such a personal thing because I had different skills and abilities than you do, and so you've got to figure out what what your superpower is, and you've got to maximize that, and so. People sometimes tell people to work on their strengths, and I, I think I mean, on your weaknesses, and I think that's crazy. Work on your strengths. Figure out what you're good at and get better at it. Because that's what you're going to really be able to change the world doing, is that thing that you're already good at. And so there, there is no answer. There's an answer for you. And, and do that, whatever that is. You, you had a question? Yeah. Um, so seemingly, 
because what we did is we found some people who were passionate and good at fences. And we don't want to micromanage them. We say, hey, you're good at fences. You go do fences. And if you are really great at that and you can make money doing that, then we take, what we do is the money always flows to and from the parent company. And so the, the business is independently operated. And so the next business could be dog leashes or whatever else. It doesn't matter. Just if you have passionate people who are good at what they do, they independently run the business, and then it kind of flows. Any other questions before we end up? Okay, thank you.